Members will now take a, a, a little while here to hear the final speeches from the members who will be leaving and departing the chamber. So um, we'll go through them in order from least senior to most senior member of the chamber. So we'll start with the member from Hennepin, Representative Flanagan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, colleagues. Today was really special. I got to gavel in um, with my daughter, Siobhan, who many of you have seen uh, running around here. Siobhan is convinced that I work in a castle and that people give me candy all day long uh, because that is what occurs here uh, when, when she uh, attends session with me. And you know, today, I don't know that she thought it was out of the ordinary. This is simply just mommy's job and what she does. And to me, what she thinks is ordinary is extraordinary. I started my work in uh, this movement working on the campaign of the late Senator Paul Wellstone. And I never thought that running for office would be something that I would do. I just thought that I would help other people do it. But what I saw when I first got involved in public life, when I ran for the Minneapolis School Board, was that there weren't enough indigenous people involved in politics. And I thought I'd do a little bit of work around that. And spent almost two decades uh, working to find additional indigenous leaders, encourage people to run for office at the state level, the city level, the school board level, and the tribal government level. And now, within this chamber, we see that work. There are six indigenous members of this house, and that's pretty phenomenal. And I am, I am thrilled that my daughter just thinks, that's normal. That's the way it is. The Native people, Native women, serve. So I started here in the Capitol as an advocate, and then I got to be on the inside, working on bills that were important to my community, around issues of child care, paid family leave, family economic security. And for a kid who grew up with a different colored lunch ticket, I don't think I saw myself being able to stand here. Sometimes we hear stories about those people we talk about who is deserving and who is not. And sometimes I don't always think that I, uh, sometimes I still feel like that kid with a different colored lunch ticket. So each day, and you know how special it is when you walk in here and you see your name up there on that board. What an honor and a privilege to be able to be that kid with a different colored lunch ticket, to put a name in the face to a lot of those families that we simply do not know. So when we talk about those people, I am those people. And those people deserve to have a voice within this chamber. I'm grateful for the friendships that I have made. I am grateful for being part of a freshman class of two <laughs> with Representative Eklund and then kind of 2.0 with the additional freshman class. I'm grateful that people think I'm everywhere because folks get Erin May Quaid and I um, mixed up all the time. She's blonde. Wait, I'm blonde. You're a brunette. Um, 
I'm also really grateful for the Posse Caucus. When I talk to people about the People of Color and Indigenous Caucus uh, across the country, um, folks are like, how did you do that? And I was like, well, we just decided we wanted to do it. And I think it's phenomenal how um, we've been able to come together and set an agenda and do that together. And I'm excited to see how that work continues into the future. And that also means that as the face of Minnesota is changing, the face of this legislature will change as well. And I think the more that our government reflects the community it seeks to represent, the better that we'll do in governing together. I'm also grateful for uh, friendships on the other side of the aisle, which I think are oftentimes the ones that surprise folks the most. Um, and uh, I think one of my most unlikely friendships is my friendship with uh, Jim Nash. Um, many of you may have seen us tweeting at each other at the U2 concert. It's probably the only thing that we have in common. So uh, thanks for that, uh, Representative Nash. Um, I also just wanted to, to take a moment um, to thank the, the staff, the partisan and nonpartisan staff, um, who do an incredible job. Um, and I think that until you're here and you are sitting at these desks, you don't know um, the incredible dedication um, and how uh, just passionate and smart and relentless all of you are. So thank you uh, so much for the work you do to make Minnesota work. And a special shout out to Pat Murphy. Um, your leadership uh, makes an incredible difference here and the personal sacrifice that you make um, means so much. Also, you're my mom's favorite, so. Um, and I, I also wanna just thank my family my little girl who is here, and all of you know what a sacrifice our own families make for us to be able to do this. And um, it, is, uh, it is an honor to serve, but sometimes it is, uh, it's hard um, to not be there at bedtime. And um, I think it's important that our families know that uh, we have a responsibility to them, but that we also have a responsibility to the community. Um, and sometimes that can be a tough balance. So I'm grateful uh, to my family um, for making that sacrifice as well. But again, what an incredible honor to serve. I know I'm the person with the least seniority. Um, and I also know uh, what you all will be facing next, uh, next session. Uh, the person who will be likely in my seat, I apologize for that. Um, <laughs> but Garofalo, you'll have your sparring buddy back, so. We just have different styles, that's fine. Um, but mostly, my, um, my hope I hope that my vocation, regardless of where I am, is to ensure that people are seen, heard, valued, and believed. So that work will continue no matter where I go, but I hope that, that part of that element remains here as well. And that I think um, when we make decisions based on how the most vulnerable folks in our state will fare based on those decisions, I think that's a pretty, pretty good way to make decisions. I think it's good for the state and it's good for all of us. Um, I also hope that as we move forward, the images that you see in this Capitol, which have changed, both in the artwork, these guys are still around, they probably will be for a long time, but that we also have more accurate depictions of indigenous people and that leadership will continue and I am honored and humbled to have been a small part of that. So uh, in my own language, I say chi mi uh, to all of you for this opportunity to, to serve. Purple rain, purple rain, 
Will you guys do this for me just like for a second, please? Yeah? Okay. Ready? Purple rain, purple rain. Purple rain, purple rain. Thank you. The member from Hennepin, Representative Applebaum. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Hey now, it has been an honor to serve my hometown district, all of my constituents, and the people of Minnesota for the past four years. Now, just in case I get muted later, I'm going to start with the thank yous so those can <laughs> be sure to get into the record. Thank you to my constituents for electing me and re-electing me as your representative. Thank you to my colleagues for recognizing my considerable abilities, electing me as deputy minority leader and, and believing in me all along the way. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you to the incredible staff we have here at the legislature, particularly the following people at the DFL House Caucus for advising me, helping me, and making me look good and smart, no matter how difficult that has been on far too many occasions. Uh, DJ, Jan uh, DJ Danielson, who I am grateful to have worked with since the beginning of my time here, thank you. And I'm very lucky to call a dear friend. Our constituent services staff, Mariah Knudsen, Ann Hamry, Paula Thompson, Greg Bergstrom, and the leadership staff here, Bryn House, Susie Merson, Merthen, and Susie Bates. Thank you guys very much. Thank you to my campaign teams and the volunteers for my campaigns, especially John Martin, Danny Abrams, Mark Haney, Janet Robert, and Congressman Bill Luther. I wouldn't be here without you all. Thank you to my family, my mother, Robin, dad, Jay, sister, Jill, brother, Tommy, my late grandfathers, Sid Applebaum and Lynn Johnson, my grandmothers, who I'm lucky to have still living, Gloria Johnson and Lorraine Applebaum, in addition to all of my uncles, aunts, cousins, and many friends who helped me over the past four plus years. It's taken a village, and I will always remember it, cherish it, and greatly appreciate it. And a very special thank you to my wife, Kate, and our new baby girl, Julia Lynn, who is six, year, six weeks old today. It's been a long six weeks. <laughs> Feels like six years. Kate, thank you for supporting me and loving me through good times and bad during this venture into public service. And Jules, you have been the greatest thing to ever happen to me. And uh, Daddy looks forward to watching you grow up and not having to be in St. Paul all the time. <laughs> you know, when I reflect on the past really five years of running for office and serving in this remarkable institution, the word that most accur accurately describes my experience is pride. I am proud that I set door knocking and fundraising records in my campaigns that I like to remind everyone about probably too often. Thought I'd get a bigger laugh there, just like I, th I thought I was going to get a bigger laugh earlier with something, too. Maybe it's time for me to go. I am proud to never have lost an election. And I'm proud of my service here at the legislature. I'm proud for consistently being a strong advocate for everyday working people who are trying their best to earn a living and support their families in a healthy, safe community. I'm proud of what I was able to accomplish. In particular, I'm proud that I was successful in creating the nation's first student loan debt tax credit, which is going to provide direct relief to 65,000 students this first year and provide nearly $120 million in relief over the next four-year period. And finally, I am proud to be the first to propose legislation for legalizing the recreational use of marijuana in Minnesota. No laughs or smiles over there. <laughs> now, as we know, 
This effectively started a statewide conversation that will lead to enactment in the future. But the key, everyone out there watching, is that you have to elect Democrats. Once these Republicans are gone and they're out, marijuana is in. <laughs> and when that day comes, you are welcome, Minnesota. Mr. Speaker, members, staff from both sides, partisan and nonpartisan, it has been a tremendous honor. I'm proud to have done this. I thank you very much, and I've always wanted to say this on the House floor, Baba Bowie. Thank you. Member from Anoka, Representative Whalen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Most of you know why I'm leaving. I fell in love, getting married, and moving to England. When I announced to my constituents I was not seeking re-election, it was uh, bittersweet, and I just said sometimes life brings unexpected curveballs, and life brought me a fiance from England. We talked and prayed a long time about where we should start life. And so, with some heaviness of what I'm leaving behind, but joy at what lies ahead, I'm just saying goodbye for a time. But coming to that decision was not easy. And at the beginning of my second session, I felt I was in turmoil because I had just gotten engaged and had no idea if I was gonna run again. But when I was first elected, I knew I was called to be here. I loved it, I loved serving, I loved all of you. And yet my fiance also loved what he did in England and was what I do more important than what he did. So it was confusing. We sorted out our priorities, we prayed. And I realized something in that time, that God wasn't gonna force me to do anything and he wasn't gonna force me to do anything and I had to make a choice. So I realized that if I sacrificed my life here, I would gain something incredible. Love, marriage, adventure, opportunity to grow in my faith and trust in God. And it was painful like sacrifice is, but it was very worth it. But you know, before this decision was clear to me, before I had made that peace that I was going to resign, I was in turmoil and my legislative work was in turmoil. I didn't know what I was doing here. I thought, okay, I need to not uh, let my work here suffer because my personal life is in question. So I did what I do, as most of you probably are not surprised. Again, I prayed and I said, God, I need help. What am I doing here at the legislature? I want to serve well. And I wrote down what I felt he said to me, which I know might sound weird to some people, but I do believe God speaks to us in a lot of different ways. And he told me to love greatly, love mercy, do justice, Walk humbly before me. Do not fear. As much as you are able, live at peace with all men. Be humble. Be who I created you to be. Love your colleagues. Love conquers. Love covers a multitude of sin. Keep focused on me and pray. And he brought me to a couple passages the Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesians. And Paul said, I have not ceased to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And I pray that for myself and for all of us and for the state of Minnesota and so many others. And Paul goes on to say in that same letter that he prays that we would comprehend with all the saints the breadth, the height, the length, the depth, the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled with the fullness of God. And I've learned that that love means knowing how to love others, knowing how to love myself, knowing how to forgive. Because if I cannot love myself and if I cannot forgive myself, how can I extend that love and forgiveness to others? I know that I am often in need of forgiveness myself and Indeed, in fact, one of my favorite quotes about forgiveness, as many, as many of you may have heard, if we don't forgive, it's like drinking poison and expecting somebody else to suffer. Forgiveness is so that we are able to move on, and in this, in this place, I've found I need to do that a lot. Um, and 
it's good. God taught me in this season more and more about forgiveness. And so I ask for all your forgiveness. If I've ever hurt you, if I've ever wounded you, please forgive me and talk to me. I want to have relationship with people. People are so much more important than politics. People are so much more important. And I have just prayed that God would help me show that, show that love. And I know I have failed often, but I hope I succeeded more than I failed. And just interestingly, as many of you know, the royal wedding happened yesterday. And in the sermon that was preached by a fiery American bishop, Michael Curry, he talks precisely about what I felt God was saying to me. And I'm just going to quote it, a part of it. He says, there is power in love. There is power in love to help heal when nothing else can. There is power in love to lift up and to liberate when nothing else will. There is power in love to show us the way to live. He then quotes a stanza from an old hymn that says, if you cannot preach like Peter and you cannot pray like Paul, you just tell the love of Jesus and how he died to save us all. Members, I hope that that is what I've been able to show and that you all know Jesus loves you. And if you don't know it, I'd love to talk to you about it. But either way, it has been an honor a blessing, a privilege to serve with each and every one of you on both sides of the aisle, staff, my constituents, my community. It's with overwhelming pride for this state and deep gratitude that I thank you all. And members, I hope this speech was not a Fushian representative Nash. He now owes me $2. God bless you all. The member from Nicolette, Representative Johnson C. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Um, I'm going to start my remarks by thanking my wife, April. We've been married 37 years. I would not have done this without her. And to be honest, I don't think I could have done this without her. And uh, you know, I, basically, she encouraged me to run. I started at age 60, and I wasn't so sure I wanted to do this, but she helped me figure out how to do that, what that meant. But then she's been supportive through all these years. But mostly what she's really offered me is a lot of good judgment, a lot, a lot of wisdom. Um, there's times that come up in, in this job, certainly in, in my district and, and here as well, but mostly at home in many ways, uh, we're just kind of trying to figure out how to do something, how to handle a situation. And her wisdom was exceedingly valuable. I want to thank all of you folks here. The relationships here I just treasure. And when I say all of you here, it's certainly all, all of you in this room tonight. And, but all the people that work in St. Paul, you know, there's about, I, sometimes I've estimated there's, oh, a couple of thousand people that seem to work intensely at the Capitol. Mm -hmm. And what a, what a cast of great characters. What, a, what a, a capacity that these people have. I'm not so sure Minnesota understands how much can get done. And we, we see it especially towards the end of the session. But it's just with the, the systems that work here and, and, and the help that, that, that's given to each other, it's really tremendous. And you know, I, when I came here, I, I always thought, I kind of felt like I, it was Mr. Johnson coming to St. Paul. Or maybe it was Mr. Clark coming to St. Paul. <laughs> you know? And I felt that when I first came, and in many ways I still feel that today. And, but anyway, the help that, I, just, it's been just great work with, working with all of you. But a very special thanks for me anyway goes to my neighbors and uh, the people who live in District 19A. April and I, we've lived in, we moved to Mankato in 1982. And I can't tell you how many times we've said how fortunate we are that we live there. There's a story that goes behind it, I won't tell you, but it's just really happen chance that we ended up in Mankato. And, but there's, and the reason we say that is that there's just a lot going on in, that, in, our, in our home that is uh, really pretty special. And my work in this job, it just seemed to be magnified. And it's magnified, I think, mostly in, in, in a bunch of ways. Uh, one of the things, uh, 
when we drove in, right away we noticed those farms. We did. We drove, drove through Nicollet County and we saw those beautiful farms. My wife grew up in western, South, uh, western North Dakota where, where it's a little drier farming than it is in Nicollet County. And so we always appreciated those farms. But one of the things that's really been magnified for me in, the, in this job is that, you know, those family farmers are about producing food and fuel, but those family farms are about uh, so much more. And I always like how the pork producers talk about it, farm families as opposed to family farms. And that's really at the base of a lot of where I live. But it's really w one of the most special things that we've appreciated all these years is how people react to problems in our area. And they see a need and they deal with it. And the way they tend to deal with it, or the way we tend to deal with it, is by really through collaborative efforts. And people get around together, they get people from different parts of the community will come together to solve a problem or work towards solving a problem. So actually, a lot of these challenges won't be solved, but they get addressed. And it's through that collaboration, those collaborations, and those collaborations last over years and sometimes decades and are amazingly effective. And it makes for such a re really uh, uh, formidable community. Uh, but maybe the most beautiful thing is, is a phrase that I hear in St. Peter that I think says a lot about where I live. And that it is that everyone is welcome every day. And when they say everyone, they mean everyone. And it's so beautiful. It's just beautiful that, to live in that kind of a way and have a community that does that. It's kind of hard to know what, how to write this speech. Uh, I thought, well, should I remind this, the, the people in the body here about uh, you know, staffing, making sure we finish the staffing at, at the security hospital? I don't know. Maybe I should or shouldn't. Should I remind the folks here about Highway 14? We made a step today, but it's still not finished to do all, and I'm counting on you guys doing that now. Um, but also, should I remind you about really the focus, I hope, of the work going forward is always keep in mind those young families, and particularly their children. And if you do that, things will fall into place really well. So before I head out into the sunset, but more realistically, since the time of night, it's more like I'll grab the light rail into the sunrise to go back to my apartment. I want to just share with you the two things that I heard most commonly at the door. And, you know, uh, before I share those, I, I just want to say that I did enjoy those door knocking. I knocked my, door, uh, my district pretty completely twice. And I, I got I to thank all those folks at those doorsteps. They received me at their door, and we had conversations, and... It was really nice, and people are amazingly polite. I'm really struck by the fact that the citizenry that I met is well-informed, and they care. They care about what's going on. They follow what's going on here, and they deeply care about it, and they're, again, capable about it. But I always ask them, what should be the priority for Minnesota? That was my question for them. And there was two responses that came out overwhelmingly the most common, and I think you've heard them before, and I'll leave you with this. The first one is work together and to get the job done. Thank you very much. The member from Washington, Representative Ward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's called retirement, but a friend introduced me to the concept of inspirement, and that's where I'm going. The Minnesota House of Representatives was not a place I ever expected to be. I'm the first in my family and my husband's family to be in politics. Like many women who enter politics, I was asked to run for the office. And that invitation came at a time when, in my life, I was able to answer yes to the call. And I'm so grateful to have had the opportunity to be here with you to serve the people of Minnesota. Together, we've accomplished some good work, meeting our government's responsibilities for education, public safety, and infrastructure creation and maintenance. This is the work that must be done collectively for the good of all communities. I remain in awe of the passion with which 
all, we all strive to reflect the will and needs of the people as we sort through the priorities, possibilities, and challenges. I've learned so much from all of you and from the work of the committees. I will carry these experiences with me as I continue to work for justice and peace for all people. Government and politics are tools. Tools to make the world a better place, not just a, pl a better place for ourselves, but a better place for the world. I'll continue my work with the National Institute of Civil Discourse, and as a private citizen, we'll continue to support the Civility Caucus, working with you to, to um, make those changes. The growth of the Civility Caucus has brought me a great deal of pride and hope. When we elected, when we elected legislators worked together with earnest respect and humble candor, we truly reflect the will and the needs of the people. Minnesotans across the state plea for a way out of hyper-partisanship, a way of honest compromise in which no one gets everything that they want but most people get what they need. Over the past six years, I've seen some changes in the approach to work here, both in communities and on the House floor. There's no quick fix to changing a culture, and I'm grateful for the trust I have in, you have invested in the process and for the energy that many of you have brought to the conversation. There is no clearer way to see the progress we can make then in those moments of unification, healing, restoration, and reconciliation. We often refer to the house as a body. And if a body is to work well and be healthy, its systems must be coordinated and steps taken to maintain that health. This requires intentionality, commitment, empathy, and compassion qualities I see here among all of you. I am so grateful to have had this opportunity to serve the people of Minnesota in this body. First, I must thank the House staff, without whom we could not function. The unsung heroes of this session are, as Representative de Applebaum mentioned, the people who, who are in our committees or our houses. But David Serdez, Marilee David, Tim Johnson, Gail Marumanowski, and our chief clerk, Patrick Murphy. The sergeant and his crew. I also thank the many staff members who stand and sometimes run behind the scenes and who truly keep the process moving. They do it for all of us, with no exceptions. They serve with professional skill, grace, good humor, and kindness. Thank you to my LAs, Krista, Mary, and Peter in order, and all the other House staff and par the partisan and nonpartisan staff. The people of Minnesota should be proud of how professional, smart, caring, and skilled these people are. They don't know. I have been asked what most amazed me when I came to the legislature. And I can say with all good heart and honesty, it's the wonderful people. Thank you to my family. Joe and I celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary last year. And um, it's time we had some fun and had time to do some other things. Thanks to uh, my children and grandchildren as they have been in parades and helped with all sorts of things. Um, my communities, my volunteers and supporters, and the city and county leaders who work so diligently with us for the good of all people. What will I do now in my inspirement? This is a question I've heard daily since I announced my retirement from the House. 
I will spend more time with my family and friends, travel, be creative in ways that have been neglected these past six years. As a private citizen, I will continue to advocate for priorities that, have held, that I, I have held for so many years and have worked on here at the House. Swiss poet and philosopher Henry Friedrich Emil said it well, life is short, and we do not have too much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us. So be quick to love, and make haste to be kind. The member from Hennepin, Representative Allen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's an honor to follow one of the kindest legislators here. When I first, uh, when it, it never entered my mind to run for office, ever. I had, um, it, it, it was Karen Clark, Representative Clark, and Sharon Day who um, said, well, what about you? <laughs> and I had, it was a special election, so I had very little time to think about it. But I come from a family when someone asks you to do something, it, it is, and it's an honor to be asked. And so that if, if, if there was any way I could do it, that I, I was going to say yes, so it didn't take me too long to do that. And another thing that uh, Sharon Day says, has told me a few times, she said, thank you for, for bringing us along with you. And that was the reason why I ran. It was to be a voice for those left out to fight for social and economic justice. And so I want to talk a little bit about those voices that I have tried to bring here to these chambers to uh, I'm going to start with um, with my parents they we, we um, they moved around uh, since I was five and so one of the things um, my father is an Episc was an Episcopal priest and so he said well his uh, position and I think of it, this office, that it, it should never be about the person, but it is about the office, and that it, for, for me, the office is an extension of the community that I represent. And so those voices, um, you know, come, come from such a diverse district, uh, mixed income, mixed race, new immigrants, Native Americans. And so, I had no idea when I said yes that I was going to be making history as the first American Indian women to be elected to the legislature. And, it, and for me and, and my family, it wasn't something that was um, out of the ordinary because my great-great-grandfather, Charles Wesley Allen, was a state legislator when South Dakota was a territory. And so those voices bringing here, um, the, uh, when I was first uh, elected, uh, Lori Stravant um, asked to interview me, and I was like an hour late because I couldn't, I had no idea. I'd never been here before. And so I was an hour late, and, uh, and that was, uh, um, and, and so she, it caught me a little bit off guard because she asked, it was, it was during the anniversary of the Dakota conflict, and she asked me, 
well, did you have relatives? And I'm somebody that can't remember names or dates or uh, you know, who was the great grandfather and who was, and I couldn't really give an answer, but I did say, yes, I am Dakota. And so I wanna give you just a little bit of how, to put this sort of in context of my being the first American Indian uh, woman here. And I'll start with Lakota, because I am Lakota, I am Dakota, and I am Ojibwe. So I talked about Charles Wesley Allen. He was born in 1851, and he, um, his brother was the first mayor of Kansas, Wichita. And then he joined some volunteers and came to Fort Laramie in, in Wyoming, and that's where he met um, and married a woman of, these are my uh, father's words, my, brother, my father wrote a book um, about all this. He married a woman of Indian and French blood with a German name who, who later um, uh, changed her name to Emma Hopkins. And so, and they had 12 children. He was a, a newspaper reporter at one point for the Herald and he uh, covered the Indian Wars and he witnessed um, uh, Wounded Knee Massacre on September 29th, 1980. And every year my father would take us to South Dakota to that mass grave from, from as far back as I can remember and, and, and would, and you know, you're too young to know about it, but at some point, probably like age 11, 12, you become aware of the significance of that, of that, um, that mass grave. He married, uh, he had a son, Joseph, who married Rosanna uh, uh, Parks. Um, Roseanne Parks uh, spent eight years at uh, Carlisle Indian School. And when she returned, she could no longer speak Lakota. She could no longer communicate with her mother. She was uh, estranged from her siblings. Um, and this is my, uh, uh, would be my great grandmother. And so that is how recent that is. Um, and so then we moved to the Dakota side. Um, and my great grandmother, her name was Alice Mary Redwing. And she is a descendant of one of the Redwing chiefs. She was Metawakanan, Dakota. And she, um, her family, her mother, father were uh, Joseph Wilson, Annie Wilson. They were um, removed from Minnesota, and their story is that her, her parents were shipped down the Mississippi River to St. Louis, Missouri for the winter. And then after many died there, the survivors were shipped up the Missouri River to Crow Creek, South Dakota, then put back onto boats and sent to Santee, Nebraska. And that's where uh, Ellis Redwing, my great grandmother, met her husband, who is Philip Charles Bruyer. And he was non-Indian, he is, I mean, he was half Indian, and his um, father was uh, married the daughter of War Eagle. And so War Eagle in, in Sioux City, Iowa, um, the Bruyers were, were uh, fur traders, trappers. Um, so he married uh, two of War Eagle's daughters, where Eagle had, I think, five daughters, no sons. Her name was Blaze, Blazing Cloud. Uh, they called her Blazy. And their son, Philip Charles Bruyer, became an Episcopal priest. On my, on my mother's side, I don't know too much about my mother's side. She, her father was Ojibwe, her, um, from Wider. 
And he was worked for the BIA, so he went to Rosebud, where my mother was raised. And um, so uh, my, my grandmother was, was half Lakota, half French. They grew up on Rosebud, and that's where our, I'm enrolled in my mother. Um, my mother, her mother, my grandma, didn't speak too much when we were growing up. She was always there. But she spent her formative years in uh, the boarding school. And she, would, she did tell the story. And I'll never forget that, the story that she told about um, being six or seven and running in the, in the grass in the field trying to hide uh, because the, the wagons were coming to pick them up to take them to boarding school. And so she was terrified, and so they, but she was always tracked down, put in a wagon, and then taken to boarding school, and then she would come home in the spring, and the, her family didn't have the means to go to visit her, and so, and so she lost her language. And so I, I don't have my language. Um, But one thing about now having four Native women here is that it wasn't that I didn't never, like, I, I didn't, I wasn't able to see myself here because it's, it was just something over there. Um, but once I got here, I realized that it's not any different than what I've done all my life as a student, as an attorney, as being part of, you know, integrated into, into when I came here, it was 98% white. And so, but, it, and I had been in those environments before. And so, and I knew how to be in those environments as a Native woman without losing my identity. Simulation uh, was not, not something that I will fight always not to be assimilated. Um, and so I bring those, that lineage, the, that, that my great, great grandfathers and grandmothers and grand, I bring them here and when we had the, the, the swearing-in ceremony, because I was in a, a special election, I think it, it was the first time that we brought the drum into the chamber. And, and that, it was so overwhelming to the drum. There's something about that that changes your, it's just the, the beat of the drum that, that it changes, I think, your brain waves and your, and it takes you to another place. I mean, it, it is, um, some of the past, and, and, but it, it is, the drum is alive. Um, and that was here in the chamber. It was a children's drum group. And people all over the state watched that. It was filmed. And it was something that um, I think for the first time, it was like any people th felt like we had a place, that our place here is recognized that we can be at we can be the governors, that we can be. Um, and, so, and so that, I think, is just amazing how every, I say every year I've been here that the number of, of minority legislators increased by 200%. And <laughs> I think we may have a plateau there, but that's a different story um, about some of the barriers in, in outside of the metro area for candidates of color to run. But, but I just, I wanted to share that a little bit with you, and, and I think my brothers and sisters, my brother and sister would be proud that I, um, I could tell that story. Um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a lot to remember, but it is something that my father put in a book for all of us, and then I will keep telling that story to my own grandchildren. Um, I have uh, three grandchildren, and then my sister's children call me grandma, because in the Lakota and kinship, it, the um, sisters will raise, we raise our children together. And so I, I, so I, I want to uh, thank you for um, it, the people who helped uh, to get me here 
and the people in the district who are um, who know much more about this than I do, and who, um, as I'm leaving this office, uh, will uh, many qualified uh, candidates will follow, and it's something that I believe that should be shared. Um, and I want to uh, thank um, you know there all of you. I I, I watch and I listen. And, it, and there's, you are all leaders. You all have so many skills and things that, that I've learned, uh, learned from you. And I don't want to start naming names or, or even uh, thinking because I will forget. But I will, um, one thing that struck me, someone said, um, you know, there should be more lawyers here. And I, my answer is lawyers are overrated. And, uh, but, and we forget that how many lawyers there are on the staff and how many, how they advise us on a daily basis. And, and so I want to thank all of them um, for, for how um, hard they work to advise us on so many different and complex issues. And my family, um, you know, the, the family I have uh, is very supportive. And I will go back into the community as I, and continue what I've always done, and which is when somebody asks you to serve, asks you to lead, or asks you to help, that if you can, you say yes. Thank you. Member from Hennepin, Representative Uglum. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, um, this has been the, the greatest opportunity and the greatest experience of my entire life. This is a very, very special place. You know, it wasn't too many years ago, I was cruising along and had this great little retirement job after selling my company. I was mayor of the city of Champlin. Great deal. All I needed was three votes to get a bill passed. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> one day, one day I'm at a ribbon cutting, and uh, Representative Denise Dietrich was there, Democrat from my district, of course, a good friend. And I walked up to her and I said, "Well, Denise, it was it was." early summer. I said, you're running again this fall, aren't you? And she goes, no, Mark, I'm not. You should run. <coughs> a little different. I, and uh, I think Melissa Hortman knows that story, too. Um, but that's how we do business, and that's how we do politics in Champlain. Um, so I ran. What an experience, right? I mean, uh, you don't know what you're getting into sometimes. Uh, but it was, but it was great, and and getting elected to represent the citizens of Champlin and the citizens of Coon Rapids, uh, my little portion over there, has been a great experience. It's been a humbling experience. It's been an experience that I take with great pride. <laughs> you know the responsibility that each and every one of us has for our constituents, I, I think is, is, is tremendous. And we all do it our own way. And we're all pretty good at it, otherwise we wouldn't be here. But, you know, every day when I walk up those steps out there, those nice new granite steps, thank you, Dean, uh, for all of that, um, I think of what a great institution this is. I, I, I am privileged to be, you know, one of the few people that has served uh, over the years uh, for my district. And each and every one of us is the same way. The institution is very special. Um, and it just, just doesn't happen. Uh, it's, it's the staff, it's the leadership, it's the former leaders. But 
You know, it's, this, it's the Minnesota State House of Representatives. And it's the show, it's the big show, as far as politics goes. But it's also the show that is the most responsible. The things we do here every day, the bills that we pass, some good, some not so good, and some really great, have a tremendous uh, impact. But yet, lots of people on the street, if you're talking to them and everything else, go, oh, you're a politician. You, uh, you must be somewhere around between a used car salesman and, and whatever. But, but you know, we're, we're trying the best we possibly can, and, and each and every one of us uh, has, I think, the best interests at heart. And we get through this, and we, and we, and we make laws, and we do good things for the citizens of Minnesota. It's always struck me uh, just how institutions work, how companies work, how cultures are. In this place, the culture is the people. It's the people. And we, we have just such a wide, diverse group here. Uh, and it amazes me the expertise that's in this room, the expertise across the aisle, over here, how good some people are at providing us the expertise we need, when we need it, to craft these very good laws. Where would we be without our leadership, without our committee chairs, and the people that speak up and do such good committee work? Because that's what I like, I like the committee work. Floor sessions, not so much. <laughs> 2 or 3 a.m. in the morning, not so much. Long drives home, competing with the drunks that are out on the highway and everything else, not so much. But we do a good job here. We really do. And I think sometimes we're underappreciated. Uh, you know, we go out and we do our door knocking and, and we do our political campaigning and things like that, and we put out our lit pieces. And I kind of deplore that. I don't like campaigning, never did. Um, but you get elected, and, and uh, you win the majority, and you come here and govern. One thing that, and I think you all know this, that I wish we had more of is bipartisanship. And I understand politics, we all do, but governing without talking together is not a good thing. We need to work and try and do better. I really believe that. Um, it's a hard thing to do, because we all like to win. We all like to win, but sometimes it's harder to work with the competition. Um, sometimes it's harder to really run things from an efficient manner. Politics, well, democracy by its very nature is pretty messy, okay? And true democracy is like that. It takes a long time, a lot of debates, and everything else, but everybody should get their say. And I think that's really important in this body. You know, I believe in term limits, so that's why I'm retiring. My wife says, I don't care about term limits, just get home. <laughs> but but uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's been a wonderful experience. There is life after the legislature. There really is. And uh, we're fortunate, um, myself and my family. We can, we can travel and do the things we want we have some wonderful kids and grandkids, and I intend to spend a lot of time with them. I'm gonna have a little fun too. Many of you know I love to motorcycle, and, and uh, we're gonna be riding around all over the country uh, and, and really uh, do the things that you put off. And it, there comes a time in everybody's life when you have to make that decision. 
You know, getting away from the professional life, going to work, putting on a tie in the morning or a suit and everything else, giving up the power of a legislature, of, of, of a legislator, and, you know, receding in the background, that's tough. But it's good in many respects, and there's always a time for that. There's a time for everybody. And um, I just want you to let all of you know it's been a wonderful experience here. So thank you very much. Member from Sherburne, Representative Newberger. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, members. I just uh, want to start by saying thank you to uh, to God. I believe that it's a miracle that we're all here in the first place, some more than others. Um, but I am very grateful. Uh, I have my faith, and I'm and I'm very honored, and it's such a privilege to be here. And I wanted to uh, say thanks uh, for the experience that, that got me here. It was about 12 years ago I was... Did somebody need a medic? Emergency! Somebody need a medic. <laughs> <laughs> Knocked them dead, didn't we? And <clears throat> Representative Albright, in my line of work, we call that an adverse reaction to gravity. <laughs> so 12 years ago, cold winter day, I'm sitting in my ambulance listening to talk radio. I know that Representative Liebling would be probably listening to it, too. And uh, we got a call, car crash on 610. And it was one of those days where the wind was blowing at about 40 miles an hour and it was diagonal and it was really slippery and we pulled up onto this uh, off-ramp and uh, there was a van and there was a man that was trapped under the van and we, it was one of those situations where you didn't want to touch the van because if you did, bad things would happen. And we needed to wait for a fire truck to come so that we could hook some chains up to the van and then hook it up to the fire truck so that the van wouldn't slide. So I'm standing there, and I look at my partner, and I said, I'm going to get in the ambulance, I'm going to pull it around to the front of the crash, and it'll serve as a windbreak, so at least we don't have that coming at us. My partner says, yeah, good idea. So I get in the ambulance, and I very slowly drive around the crash, and I park the ambulance, and I get out, and I'm starting to say something to my partner, and the next thing I know... My feet go out in front of me and my hands go back like this and all I see was the sky and everything went black. And uh, in one of the reactions, you put your hand out like this. Well, I had shattered my left wrist. Um, to this day, I have a titanium plate and 13 screws that holds it all together. So uh, I had four months. There's a, we're getting to this point here. I had four months of recovery and I was at home feeling sorry for myself. And the phone rang. It was my local Republican BPOU regional leader. And she said, Jim. I said, yeah. <laughs> she said, we have an opening on our BPOU. We really could use some help. I said, okay. What'll it take? And she said, I promise you, one hour a month, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not so much. Here we are. So <clears throat> suffice to say, though, I'm really grateful for that because that's really what, that's really what started my involvement but uh, I wanted, I started out by saying I was very thankful to God, but I'm also very thankful uh, to the people in my district, House District 15B. Um, I honestly believe that they're, they are the salt of the earth, and I, I'm very grateful for them electing me to this position. Um, I'm also very grateful for all of you, my fellow members, all of you. Um, I really appreciate who you are. Uh, I truly do. Um, there's a few people in particular, a couple of chairs, um, I want to thank Steve Draskowski, 
Um, I just do. You're just a rock solid conservative. And my first year serving in the legislature, you were a real, um, you were a real lighthouse for me. I'm very grateful for that. I owe you a debt of gratitude. A, a debt of gratitude. Uh, Chair Fabian, um, I have had so many problems in my district, and I would folks would come down from my district, and Dan Fabian would get there, and then. By the time we were done trying to work through this problem, they were like ready to write him a check, not me. I'm just like, stop that. But he did, Dan Fabian did such an amazing, amazing job helping me with constituent issues. I just can't thank you enough. Uh, Pat Garofalo. <laughs> what can you say? <laughs> thank you so much uh, for, um, for opening the door for me to helping me being uh, on the Energy Committee. It's been an honor to serve there. Peggy Scott, don't stop fighting. Don't stop. You're on the right track, and Minnesota needs more Peggy Scotts. I can tell you that right now. Um, Brian Johnson, thank you for allowing me to, to continue to serve on the Public Safety Committee. Uh, that's truly been, well, that's just been fun. <laughs> I'll just tell you that. Uh, Speaker Dalt. Thank you. Uh, there's been a number of times uh, over the past six years where I've been able to, I, I will grab you with no notice, um, and I'll say, let's go talk, and we'll sit down in the, in the back, and it's not Speaker Dalton, Representative Newberger, it's Kurt and Jim. And what we say, what we've said sometimes have maybe been a little bit heated on my side. <laughs> You've always absorbed that, but I, I, I really appreciate that. And the same goes with my first uh, uh, seatmate. Um, my first seat was right here, and uh, Joyce Pepin sat here, and she babysat me for my first two years, and so thank you very much for that. I, I do, I appreciate that deeply. Um, what would I change here? Oh, wait, there's two, other, there's two other people that I have to thank. One's Dr. Bill Glan. Is he here? Bill Glan here? He's a, one of our research guys. You know what? He's probably the smartest man down here. That guy's, he's, he's not just smart, he's scary smart, and I can call him any time, and he will answer, and he will have an answer for you. That's, that's just such a blessing. But I also want to say a, a specific thank you to our Sergeant at Arms, uh, Bob Meyerson. You are the epitome of professionalism. Can we, say th can we give him a round of applause? I, uh, Bob and I, as some of you might not know, but Bob and I actually worked the street together years ago. And when I first uh, was elected, or when I was elected here and he was first hired, we're like, hey, <laughs> here we go again, except uh, here we are. Um, what would I change about this place? Well, there's only one thing I would change, and I have to be very honest. Um, well, when have I not been? <laughs> but, you know, the first rule of politics is if it feels good, don't say it, but, well... You've all been with me when I've been learning that lesson. Um, but I will say this. Uh, the only thing that I would change in this entire chamber is the voice of the people is not the voice of God. Okay, I've, I've been waiting six years to say that, and it's off my chest. Um, but I feel better about that. But I wouldn't change anything. I seriously wouldn't. Um, some of the things I'm very proud of, I want to say recently we just, within the past two weeks, we passed some legislation that changed uh, how we approach PTSD. Uh, I, I went in, I, I, I finished working 30 years as a paramedic, and I turned in um, almost as long as the school board. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I turned in my uniforms uh, last night. I finally had a chance to stop in and turn in all my stuff, and I ran into some of my coworkers, and wow, uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, putting forward this for PTSD. Um, I have it. I, I've had it for a long time. Um, I'm not going to go there. Suffice to say, thank you so much for that. You do not know the difference that you've made uh, in the lives of so many people. Now, I listed off a, a number of GOP members that I absolutely love and adore, and I love y'all, some more than others, like I said. 
But there is, I do have, I cannot leave this chamber without identifying my favoriteest Democrat. My very favoriteest all time, I'm gonna love you forever. We have nothing in common except we both love Minnesota. And, and you know who this is. <laughs> I mean this, I really do. I have four older sisters and there's only one woman uh, in this entire chamber that, that I would call my fifth oldest sister. And you're all gonna, your, your jaws are gonna drop, but I, I love, I just absolutely adore this person, Jean Wagenius. You are my fifth oldest sister. <laughs> When, uh, when four years ago, when I was in JGEA committee and Pat Groffalo thought it was funny to assign us seats, he thought he would assign uh, oil and, and, and water. Uh, he put us next to each other and we both sat down and looked at each other. And I remember the first thing I ever said to you, as I said, you're gonna like me. <laughs> and you looked back at me and you said, make me. And it's like, <laughs> I really do. I really, I'm gonna miss you, Gene Wagenius. Well, not everything, but I'm going to miss you. <laughs> um, so I'm going to put my glasses on so I can finish up and shut up. <clears throat> oh, I was going to say something about you having a party to, to mourn, I mean to celebrate my retirement, but Rick Hansen, he's not here. So <laughs> um, finally, I would, like to just, I would like to thank my daughters, uh, Melanie, Allison, and Susan, and my son-in-law, Parker. But... Uh, Besides the good Lord, uh, Jesus Christ, the, the one person I need to thank the most is my wife, Michelle. Anyone that can be married to me for 27 years, and she's something else, I'll tell you. She is by far the better half of my life. And I want to say thank you to you all. God bless you, and thank you for doing the people's work. The member from Rice, Representative Bly. Thank you. Um, listening to all these speeches uh, reminds me why I don't speak very often on the floor of the House, because you all speak so well uh, for me. Um, I, I appreciate getting to hear your stories and getting to know you better. Um, I'm an introvert. So it's not easy for me to reach out to people. Um, and I find more solace or more uh, connection sometimes in reading than I do in uh, visiting with people. And, but um, but I, I truly value uh, the experience I've had here and the, the time I've been able to spend getting to know uh, the efforts that you put forth and, and who you are. Um, I too want to thank the staff that's here, not only the, the folks up here, but uh, I, sometimes I wonder, you know, who hired you? Where do they find you? <laughs> You're so great at what you do and so always so cheerful and welcoming and uh, it's, it's a, an honor to serve with you. And, uh, and to the, the staff that also works here, I'm, I'm sure it's the same on the other side of the aisle too, but uh, the support staff that we have, uh, all of you, um, you make us look better. You make us look like we're actually uh, good at what we do. <laughs> and um, uh, the nonpartisan staff as well. Uh, I've never met smarter and uh, uh, harder working people anywhere. It's, it's uh, quite amazing. Um, I want to thank the many friends that I've made here and uh, the, the uh, encounters we've had, the things we've worked on. Um, been very um, uh, meaningful to me. Um, also, I want to thank family and friends and uh, my constituents who sent me here uh, several times. Um, it's been a pleasure to serve and a pleasure to 
uh, do the work that helps my community. Um, the other night when we got off a little bit early, I went home and there was a friend of mine was doing a, a book reading uh, of a book that he'd, he'd written. Um, he's a professor at, at St. Olaf and he uh, writes about existentialism and he'd written a book about, which is really a memoir about um, living an authentic life. And um, uh, he talked about his own experience being a, a very depressed person and struggling in many uh, parts of his life and uh, finding that actually uh, boxing helped him overcome depression and um, being able to manage his own inner anger. And, um, but he said something that he'd gotten from uh, the philosopher Kierkegaard, which said that um, it's out of the it's, 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 it's being allowing yourself to sink into that depression, and I've been a depressive person myself. I don't know if it's being Norwegian or not, but <laughs> perhaps it is. Um, but it's, it's, it's allowing yourself to sink into that depression and realizing that what you need is other people. You need to reach out to others in the world and be able to learn from them and uh, learn to um, respect and, and be with them. I also confess that um, I've n I never, never really liked conflict, and yet um, this is a place where conflicts are supposed to be worked out. Um, politics is that, that kind of game. Um, sometimes the problems that we face and try to solve here are small, sometimes they're big. Sometimes we succeed in solving those, those, those conflicts, and sometimes we just sort of argue with, with each other and can't, uh, can't come together. I don't know if any of you are familiar with uh, a, a drawing that Leonardo da Vinci did called the Vitruvian Man. And it's a, it's a drawing of a, a man with no clothes on, standing with his arms and legs outstretched. In fact, it almost looks like he has four legs. And he's trying to reach out to a circle and a square at the same time. And uh, it's, the drawing is trying to uh, bring to life a description uh, written by uh, um, an architect in ancient Rome, uh, Vitruvius. And he was trying to design or talk about how you, as an architect, design things or use a tool that can help you with proportions. And uh, as people have looked at this drawing and studied it, um, they've realized that kind of the, the symbology of it is that you have a human being in a square and a circle. And the square, perhaps it's rationality. Perhaps it's trying to be, you know, the, this kind of scientific world that we live in. And, uh, and the other, perhaps it's the spiritual world. Perhaps it's the spirit. And what, we're, what we struggle to do is to balance those two. And I think that's something that happens here as well, that we, as a person, try to um, find a way to balance these two things in our lives. And um, I, the reason I mention that is because that's how this experience has been for me. You feel vulnerable, naked in the public. And, um, and you try to balance these different, uh, very life-supporting and very important um, things in your life. Um, some of you do it better than I can but uh, it's, it's a challenge. As, a, as I'm retiring, um, people ask me, well, what are you going to do um, with, your, with your retirement? And I often, you know, I, I kind of don't know what to say. I'm not sure what I'm going to do. Um, but something that my friend Gordon said as he was talking about Kierkegaard, he said, you know, Kierkegaard, was trying to help people understand that you don't become something like a teacher or an electrician. What you should really be striving to do is become a decent human being. Um, becoming a person who can walk in the world and uh, spread kindness, as, as uh, Ursula Ward was asking us about. Um, I know that's something that's uh, 
that I got from my ancestors as well, that my grandparents and my parents tried hard to be of service, always to put others in front of what your needs or desires might be. And um, sometimes that's a heavy load to carry. Um, reminds me, too, of my, my first teaching job. I felt that same way as, uh, um, as I went to the, the little town of Milan out by the South Dakota border. And um, it was beautiful uh, in many ways. The, the green fields, um, the lapping waters of Lac du Parle. Um, I, I lived out in the country quite a ways. I had a long, narrow driveway that went up to the little farmhouse that I rented. And uh, in the fall, uh, the geese, there would be thousands, it seemed like, geese in the fields. And I would drive my car down the uh, driveway in the morning, the geese would separate and fly up, and it was like they, were, they would lift my car up as well as we were driving along. But I realized that I was, I was drawn, as an introverted person, to the kids, the students who were really struggling, who needed another person to reach out to them. And um, in that way of using or understanding that um, depression or uh, tough times were a, a reason for you to reach out to others. Um, and um, I often forget that um, the person I really should be the most thankful to is, is my current wife. She happens to be my second wife, but um, if I had not met her and married her, I probably wouldn't be here. Uh, some of you may remember that in 2012 I had open heart surgery. And she really brought me back. Um, and uh, one of the things that, that uh, keeps me going in life is uh, writing poetry. It's not something a lot of people know about. But my first year here, when uh, Linda Slocum will remember this, um, there were a few late nights like this where um, we would exchange poetry. In fact, we had a poetry contest. Uh, on, the, on our computers, you know, it wasn't out loud or anything like that. Um, and so it was a chance for me to share some of uh, my, my poetry. And so I'd like to do that right now. And um, I mentioned my wife, and um, part of this is, is uh, to recognize her too. But, um, so I have two poems I'll, I'll read, and uh, then I'll sign off. The first one is called, Passion is Like Sailing. The geese fly overhead in a great arc. We walk arm in arm in the bright sun. Crisp air fills our lungs under the clear sky. Some say love is the beautiful dizziness of infinity, like the fool hardiness of riddles. So we search for that country where the tuning of harps is prelude to the poet's song, called the period of falling in love, where the first touch of a sweeping sensation from every encounter, every glance, causes us to reach for the warmth of each other. Just like the birds busily fetch, fetching one stick after another for their nest. With each touch, we make a home for each other and are overwhelmed by the wealth of love we have built. Some say love makes us blind, but it does far more, silencing us, making us mute, deafening our ears, paralyzing us to the world. You are the constant wind that lifts my sails, reminding me as I head over deep water. That possibility 
is the only salvation. You lift me up when deep darkness pulls me down. This one is called Walking with Fireflies. Summer air turns green in waning light of evening. We walk close, hand in hand, along a wooded path. At the edge of darkening trees come phosphorescent sparks of light from fireflies, flashing slowly off and on. They dance their dance of love over garden herbs and flowers, over clumps of grass, wanting to be cut again. Dancing not for us, but in spite of us. They have no need to heed us as we make our way home at dusk. Their movements are the rhythms and language we may understand, but cannot comprehend. Like cicada's song or chirping of crickets, sometimes you ask me questions that confuse me, like, why did I choose you? Or what does the future hold? Sometimes you feel alone, forlorn, and as though you have lost your way in the world, far from your true home. But the fireflies have found you and brought you to my home. So together we might emerge in a new skin, like the cicada, singing a new song in a home under the new sky. This is, this is a, a, a little quote, actually, from one of the farmers that I've talked to over the years. It's about looking to the long term, like the earth, not short-term gain without thinking about tomorrow or those who come after. We need to make a commitment to preserve what we have that they might have a future. When you spend time in this room, you start looking around and seeing things. I, I liked kind of when I sat over there because I could see Lincoln. And um, Dean Erdahl will remember uh, telling us that Lincoln was looking at our side of the room a lot. Remember that? I actually like th that idea that Lincoln was looking to us. Lincoln's one of the political leaders that I admire most. Mostly, I think, because he too suffered from depressions and was a very good writer. But also, I tend now to look over on this side. And above the clock, there's a circle. Some wings, and then underneath it, an hourglass, the sand passing through, reminding us that time flies. We must get our work done. And for me, time is running out. Yet there's forgiveness in that, because tomorrow the sun will rise and a new day will begin. And when we are gone, for we all, we all, will reach our end. Life will go on. New faces will come to take our places, at least as long as there is an earth to hold us. Thank you. Member from Hennepin, Representative Slocum. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. How do you follow David Bly with his butter voice <laughs> and poetry? I mean, it's just, it's not fair. <sighs> what? I'll do okay. Um, I'm kind of a spicy one, and I'm not going to go on real long, okay? I've been here 12 
years. That blows me away. That is so amazing. How did that? I guess, you know, time flies when you're having fun. And this has been a fun thing. There have been times I've been really upset. But overall, we've done good things. And I'm pleased and happy with them. I want to tell you some of the things, a couple of the things, not a great number, because he told me he'd punch me one if I was going to go on for very long. Anyway, a couple of things that I've learned over the course of 12 long years. Number one, the staff. Unbelievable. Brainiacs, always in a good mood. I just, you know, I'm kind of crabby sometimes, you know. And they know things, they have access to information. If they don't know something, they tell you, you know, mm, but I'll get it for you. And bingo, like you have it very short period of time later, it's great. The other thing I've learned here in 12 years is that we all, everybody in this room, including staff, including up front here, you guys, everybody is here for the same reason. We want a great Minnesota. We want a great place to live. We want to help the people that live here. And we all do it in a different way. We all have different ideas about how you get to that place. And you know what? It's OK. That's good. And if it stirs us up a little bit, yay, good. A little emotion, a little passion, that's good stuff. That's what keeps us, our hearts beating. A couple of months, well, a couple of years ago, I had triple bypass surgery. I had no symptoms. Oh, women don't have many symptoms commonly. So after session was over, I went to the doctor, and I, because I thought I was having gallbladder problems. No, I wasn't. I was having heart problems. And I went in almost immediately because they found significant blockages. Greg Davids reminds me he had quadruple bypass surgery, four, all four. Me, I just had triple, you know. Anyway, that was two years ago. This spring, um, well, early, before we went into session, I was up north with my daughter um, at our cabin in Lutzen where you're entirely invited if you're ever up in that area. I'm in the phone book. If you want the phone number, give me a call. Whatever, I'll give it to you. Anyway, um, I was having some shortness of breath. My ankles would get a little swollen at the end of the day. Nothing big, nothing big. My daughter, Caitlin, who is just like me, it's revenge, my mother said. Um, she, uh, she said, Mom, call the cardiologist. Call the cardiologist. And I'd say, oh, yeah, 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 <laughs> whenever. Shut up, kid, you know. Go walk my dog, you know, whatever. Um, but she really got on me, and I did call, and I made an appointment, and I went in. And they found another, the, one of the bypass vessels was blocking. And um, it was filling up with, so they wrote a rooted it, and that's not a medical term. But, and, and shoved a stent in there and put me on blood thinners and I stayed in the hospital a couple nights. Anyway, um, I had made a commitment to run again. I made a commitment at the precinct caucus night that, yeah, I'm gonna make it two more years. Well, then I had this stuff happen and I realized, you know what? I need to take care of myself. I'm a type two diabetic and I've had diabetes for 17 years. It's in my family, and it's a killer. It eats your heart up. So that's what I'm gonna do. And I want you, and this is gonna be a tough assignment for you. I would like you for just one brief minute, you tough people, just close your eyes. Just close them, you can do this. Oh yes, even you, Lesh, can do this. Close your eyes, close your eyes, close your eyes. I want you to think about and feel the wind. I want you to smell the 
pine trees that the wind is rifling through. I want you to hear the water lapping over the rocks at the side of the lake. I want you to imagine an eagle catching a downdraft, coming up, soaring through the sky. I want you to imagine the howl of a wolf a ways away. That's where I'm going to be. You can open your eyes now. The thing that I did while I was here, I like to think, is that I really worked hard for kids that are on the edge, that are not your instant success stories, that have to work a little harder because school doesn't really agree with them. One of the things I'd like to leave you with is lead with your heart, please. Lead with your heart. Thanks. The member from Washington, Representative Dean. Point of parliamentary inquiry. State your point of parliamentary inquiry. Uh, Mr. Speaker, do the rules specifically prohibit me from singing? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Unfortunately, they do not. <laughs> Well, we've had, a, we've had a request anyway. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, I just want to start by thanking the front desk staff here in this building and the people behind the wall in the revisors area and all of the folks who make this chamber work uh, because they are the people here every day. They're here when we leave at night, and they really make things uh, operate. And so... Uh, to the clerk, to all the folks uh, up here and the people who make this building work, I really uh, just want to say thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart. And for all the people who clean the building, the people who cooks, everybody here uh, is really uh, special and, and we all say thanks and we, we you know, I, I hope people who are here actually uh, take that to heart and uh, as time goes by, remember to say thanks not just when you leave. Uh, I was actually born in Representative Eklund's district. And some people know that and some people don't. A little town of Ely. I was the third son of Jim and Jane Dean. And this became a source of controversy uh, on this House floor. And Representative Rukavina specifically, uh, well, he questioned that. He was the original birther he was the Iron Range birther. He didn't believe that I was from the Iron Range until my mother copied my birth certificate and sent it to him. And so finally he came around on the whole thing and he stood up over there and he had to apologize, which we have to do once in a while around here. And he said, yeah. I called up there and I talked to the nurse who delivered you. And she said she dropped you on your head. And that's why you turned out wrong. So my mom and dad moved down to Rice Street about two and a half miles north of here. My dad uh, helped his dad run a bar, Dean's Bar. He was a fourth generation bar owner. So I grew up in uh, Rice Street up up the street here. I sat on Schmidt beer boxes, loading the coolers, listening to people around the bar. And I enjoyed that. And, uh, you know, as I looked down the street, uh, I never would have imagined that I would be working in this building right here. If you were to tell me that as a little kid, I wouldn't have believed it. And if you would have told me that as a little kid, that 
the people down here that I'd be serving with make less sense than the people around the bar, I wouldn't have believed it. But that, in fact, is the case. And uh, that's kind of the way it's supposed to be, too. Uh, I never thought I would be here. I never thought I would get to restore this beautiful building. Representative Dean Erdahl, thank you for your leadership and work in doing that. And uh, not very many people get to say they leave the place better than they found it. Uh, but you actually can say that, and I was uh, very proud to help you out a little bit with that along the way. So hats off to you and to all of the folks who were actually able to do this and to help restore this beautiful place a little bit. You know, a couple of miles up Rice Street, I met my wife, Laura, in kindergarten at McCarran's Lake Elementary School, a block away from the bar. And if you were to tell me that she and I uh, would be traveling the state, uh, running for governor, uh, meeting with all of you folks, uh, I wouldn't have believed that. I wouldn't have believed that we'd have the three greatest kids in the world, Marta, Jack, and Jane, helping us. Uh, but we do, and we have. And to all of the folks who's helped us along the way, uh, the people who've, who were there in the beginning and really helped us, we had a reputation as running very, very strong campaigns. My wife was the core of that. And she didn't like it when people tried to run against us. She thought that that was kind of inappropriate. And if she were to drive by a lawn sign from an opponent, uh, she would have to get on that immediately. That was a problem. So she would start door knocking that street. And I remember the first time we ran, and she had the list of people who lived on the street, and there were lists of one to five strong Republican to strong Democrat. And I said, well, just, you know, talk to the strong Republicans, and you'd probably be more likely to get a lawn sign. And, and she says, she calls it about dark, and she says, oh, it's like pulling teeth. I, I knock, and I, I only got four signs, and they're all fives. And I said, well, those are very strong Democrats, dear. <laughs> and she said, oh, this is going to be easy. <laughs> And she uh, worked very, very hard uh, to get me here, along with uh, Joe and Cindy Westrup and uh, Bill Polis and a lot of folks who really uh, put their life on hold to make sure I got here. When I did get here, I had great folks like Speaker Sfigum, Mary Liz Holberg, Tim Wilkin, Fran Bradley, uh, Mr. Cranky, who's right up there, and Ray Vandeveer. And I sat back where Bliss sits, and uh, Vandeveer sat next to me. And uh, he told me when I showed up that freshmen were to be seen and not heard. And I know none of you have heard that for a long time, obviously. Uh, but, <laughs> but that's actually kind of the way it was. And, um, but, you know, uh, Phil, God bless his heart, he said, uh, Representative Dean, uh, I'd correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, did Representative Vanderveer just say, uh, freshmen are uh, to be seen and uh, uh, not heard. And I said, yeah, that's what he said. He said, well, that is, in fact, not true. We don't want to look at you either. <laughs> <laughs> and so we had, uh, we, we had that, that tradition that's kind of gone now, but... Uh, <laughs> It actually helped, it helps out a little bit because there's 199 other legislators here and there's a pretty fighting good chance that one of them knows more than you do about just about anything you're going to talk about at any given time. So it's a good idea to have an idea of what you're talking about before you get up and talk. And if your first impression is standing on the House floor and not in somebody's office asking for help, you're probably uh, going to be off at a little bit of a disadvantage. And so um, I think that that's, that was probably good advice back then, and it's probably uh, pretty good advice now. But when I, when I would think about this building and about coming downtown and as a little kid from the north part and my uh, grandpa's bar and uh, the good people who sent us here, uh, the good people sitting around that bar, the families, uh, the bartenders who were there, I uh, had a bartender interviewed, my grandpa interviewed him, and he said, I'll be here on time every day, I won't drink behind the bar, and I'll only steal $20 a day. 
That's uh, the kind of folks that really sent us here, the people we represent, and they are great people. And I wonder here how we, we're going to leave and we go out these doors, and we all do, and people will come back next year. And I really, really hope uh, that when you do, you, you really recognize the people who are here, the people who serve you. I've had such great luck with folks who've helped me with my staff, and particularly um, my legislative assistants, my uh, legislative assistant Shiloh Larson, Holly Iverson are just saints. Everybody who works with our committees are saints. They help us. Uh, you know, particularly me and uh, others who are challenged with things like paper. <laughs> <laughs> and, can, and uh, trying to keep a hold of things, really do appreciate every single thing that you do. And it's such a thrill to work in this beautiful building, to work in this beautiful place. I hope we always remember that. And I hope that the people who come through these doors next year, uh, when you get reelected, you walk up, walk up the front steps. You know, don't come around the sides and looking down at your phone, walk up the front steps. Look up at the beautiful statue that was put there in 1905. It's a quadriga, it's four horses, and they're led by two women leading the prosperity of the state. And it represents the prosperity of the state as agriculture and industry. That's what those women represent. They're leading the state forward. Look at this beautiful building, that white marble, and say, I get to work here. This is where I work. What a privilege it is to represent the people back home. Come in and find your space, and when the gavel comes down and you feel the little tingle in the back of your neck, say, I get to work here and I get to represent my district. And when you go home, say thank you, thank you, thank you to the 40,000 bosses who sent you here, because not a single one of them is ever here, and they are grateful for you being here. I live really close to the Capitol. I don't sacrifice very much to be here like a lot of people do, uh, but my family has allowed me to do that, and I am thankful to them. I'm thankful to my wife, I'm thankful to my kids, I'm thankful for my constituents, and I'm thankful for the pleasure and honor of my life to serve with all of you. Mr. Speaker, we have a new big dog of the pound. <laughs> the member from Hennepin, Representative Clark. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, wow, going last is... Uh, Amazing. I, I just want to say what this institution is losing with uh, the people that have been speaking tonight is, is huge. And uh, I know that makes sp space for new people to come in, and that'll be good too, but I am just so moved by uh, the depth and passion and care that's been shared here tonight. And I wrote down a few things, because I've been here a few years, and I was trying to figure out <laughs> Um, how to uh, share them. And then earlier, uh, when I went to print them, my, the, my computer failed, and Noble helped me <laughs> recover some stuff. So I'm going to uh, share something from notes that I have here. And um, I'm, I'm going to start with um, saying that, you know, when I've, a lot of people have said to me, what are you feeling? You've been here so long. It must be bittersweet. There must be a lot of feelings you're having. And I have to say yes. But the major emotion that I have um, 
been experiencing as I've thought about saying goodbye to you all is gratitude. I just have a lot of gratitude for having um, had the opportunity to be with you all and um, with my constituents um, and with this institution. And so I want to kind of go through some thank yous to um, each of those groups and then end with my family. So let me just begin with my uh, constituents. So over the course of nearly 38 years now, and that's 18 elections where I've been elected and re-elected, I've represented a district that's gone through a lot of changes. Um, boundary and name changes as the census and redistricting has dictated that. And cultural demographic changes as Minnesota has grown and changed. I was first elected in 1980, what was then uh, District 59A, I think. Um, it was on a platform of economic and social justice. And as was mentioned earlier, like most women and cultural minorities who get elected, um, I was recruited and asked to run. It wasn't something I grew up thinking, oh yeah, this is what I want to do when I grow up. I want to be elected to, uh, an official. So. But unlike um, most DFLers, I was recruited to run by a caucus within the DFL called the Farmer Labor Association. Some of you may know about that, and it may not surprise some of my colleagues who don't know about it because of the kind of positions and work that I do here. So that's an organization that wanted to strengthen the F and the L in the DFL. The FLA, as it was known, could claim a strong heritage uh, harkening back to the Farmer Labor Party that joined with the Democratic Party in 1944. It had elected farmer labor uh, governors and Floyd B. Olson uh, and sent farmer labor senators and representatives to Washington, including Senator Elmer Benson. If you visit me in my office today, you can see Floyd B. Olson's statue right outside my window on the Capitol Mall. When I agreed um, with, to the FLA that I would run for the Minnesota legislature, I did make a demand of, of those dear recruiters. I said, I don't know how to do this job yet, uh, so please stay with me. <laughs> Come with me over there. And um, one friend actually made a documentary called that, called Stay With Me. It followed, they followed me around for six months before my election and throughout the first uh, six months of the session, and the, that documentary is available in the Minnesota Historical Society if you ever want to check it out. I, I look pretty different, I didn't have gray hair and all that. <laughs> Before I got election, elected, I was much more comfortable being an activist in the streets. And I believed, as I still do today, that really deep change has to come from the bottom up. Really deep change. So that's the way I've liked to work. Uh, being a bridge into this process and this place for my constituents, and sometimes I've joined my constituents in the streets too, joining them and um, doing that with civil disobedience, nonviolent civil disobedience. That's really important to me, and it's um, something we've talked about recently with some of the anti-protest legislation. Five times I think we looked at here recently, right? Um, so I want to thank you, my constituents. Um, this has been a journey we've taken together. Some of those are early constituents who um, recruited me to run are still, still near and dear to me, and I say thank you to them and to all the other uh, grassroots constituents who've continued to stay with me as you've come to make your presence visible here at the state capitol when we've worked to pass some really tough legislation sometimes for our neighborhoods, for our communities. And that certainly stays with me today. For example, um, some of you probably met just this week folks from Little Earth who were here lobbying with me for the last few days. Um, I brought them here so that they could be the face of the issues that they were and we were uh, working on. I want to thank um, them and other constituents who've been willing to come here to be present, to show us the face of the issues that we are bringing to the halls of the legislature. And I've done that because I have learned and seen that even the most difficult and challenging and tough legislation can pass. Hearts and minds can be changed 
When people are affected, come and tell their stories and be authentic about that. I sometimes start speeches uh, saying I got elected to the Minnesota legislature the same day Ronald Reagan got elected to be president of the United States. It's true. <laughs> And then, of course, I mentioned that was the beginning of the reason that I started to understand as a young le legislator that I wasn't going to be able to make revolutionary change overnight for my constituents, as, as much as I might want that to be the case. I learned some things take years, some four years, some 20 years, some have even taken nearly 40 years. Some have never happened, some of the changes I've hoped for have never happened, but they're the basis of, of, and they have been the basis of some frustration and, and even anger and painful disappointment that I feel when I think about what I've not been able to accomplish with and for my constituents. But I'll talk with you later because I'm going to give an assignment to carry on some of that work. Still, um, these con wonderful constituents have elected me every two years. Um, in what was after District 59, it was District 60B, then it was District 61A, and now it's District 62A. What a great district to represent. In my legislative agenda of working, for, working hard for economic and social justice has continued to be my legislative agenda through today. It's just gotten deeper and broader and actually more intense as I've grown with my district. With all its demographic changes, I have lived in the same Phillips neighborhood in South Minneapolis all that time. A neighborhood blessed with many immigrant communities coming and sometimes moving through. In the early 80s, many Hmong and then many Latinos, Latinx, who thankfully still continue to be my close neighbors. Now also a growing number of Somali neighbors. Throughout all the boundary and cultural changes, however, one of my most consistent constituencies that I want to thank um, for allowing me to be the representative are, the, are my first American neighbors, indigenous Native American Indian people who I celebrate with during this American Indian Month. What an honor. Also African American friends and constituents more on the district's edge. This district became a majority non-white district in the, I think it was the 1990s census. Today I'm told by my Latino colleague and one of my closest legislative friends and advisors here, my brother Carlos Mariani, that I have the largest Latino constituency in my legislative district. By my new sister Ilhan Omar, that I have the largest Somali constituency. And of course, by my four native sisters, my dear seatmate Susan Allen and Peggy Flanagan, Mary Kunish Podine and Jamie Becker Finn, who together make up this historic American Indian caucus. I'm, I'm honored to represent one of the very largest concentrated urban American Indian constituencies in the US. Despite the many challenges in our part of urban Indian country, as my neighborhood area is, is sometimes referred to, there are also many rich cultural assets and I'm proud to say that the 212 Little Earth of United Tribes housing families are my neighbors just a block and a half down 18th Avenue and represent around 32 tribal heritages. Please, colleagues, also remember that we are on Dakota ground here. I know Representative Erdl knows that and appreciates that. Many of us do, but we still need to be talking about what treaty rights actually mean and why the statement on the sculpture up there about us claiming the footprints of the pioneer is so, um, bears the footprints of the uh, trail of the, the trail of the pioneer uh, for the footprints of liberty. We need to tell the truth about what it really bore. It's a different word that should be ending that, maybe genocide. I do actually want to say, I do like the other words, the voice of people is the voice of God. I think that's our work to do. I do honor that. So my constituents um, are people that I'm, I'm really proud to, re to represent. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about them, just a little bit more. Well, I'm honored, um, I'm 
honored to represent the only church in Minnesota where you can still attend services in Norwegian every Sunday, and several where you can attend services in Spanish. It's also true that Minnesotans in my district can worship in any of at least five mosques, several Nepalese uh, temples, and participate in Native American religious ceremonies in several locations, especially along Franklin Avenue, including the Minneapolis American Indian Center, which I'm so happy got in the bonding bill. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this uh, rich cultural and religious diversity of my constituents has offered great opportunities for tolerance and sometimes deep challenges for our district. There's two more things about my district constituents that I want to mention and express my gratitude for. When I was first elected, it was suggested that since I was the first openly lesbian Minnesotan elected to public office, and there were no others in state legislators around the country at that time, it must also be the case that I represent and got elected by a concentrated LGBTQ population. In those days, we just said gay and lesbian. But that has never been true. And it's never been true because the census doesn't really count LGBTQ people and it's hard to know <laughs> numbers. Still, some of my colleagues, like our longest serving state legislator, Representative Lyndon Carlson right here, have LGBTQ constituents who claim great density in certain neighborhoods like Lavender Golden Valley. <laughs> It's hard to know. What I do know is that our LGBTQ demographic is so widespread as more gay people have come out throughout Minnesota, urban, rural, and suburban communities, for which I hope we are all proud or will be someday. The other demographic I've always appreciated about the people I've had the privilege to represent and who I want to thank in my district is the fact that there are so many seniors, like myself now, and so many uh, children and youth Plus, the majority of the people I represent are renters, just about 87%. I've had the honor to represent 11 high-rises in my district that house only elderly and those living with disabilities who need Section 8 housing subsidies to live and survive with dignity. Three are privately owned, the rest are Minneapolis public housing, and I love visiting these elders, and they welcome me uh, to their building at least twice a year. I thank you elder constituents, um, for always uh, being so generous and for becoming activists. Uh, I want to just tell you a quick story about my first group of elderly constituents um, that I got to work with uh, very um, challengingly, and it was, it was just it was a wonder, it's a wonderful story. Um, these are folks from Ebenezer Nursing Home in South Minneapolis. Um, what they did, and I joined them, my first sit-in in, in a governor's office, Governor Perpich, they came to sit in uh, Governor Perpich's um, office to try to get their personal needs allowance raised $5 above what it was. I've thought of them and their strategy as we've been considering the elder abuse issues recently, something to think about. My new colleague, Liz Olson, thank you for your leadership on that. It was a very impressive and effective presence for folks to change the law. I mentioned that we also have a lot of youth in my, I'll just say briefly, in my own neighborhood, we have about 6,000 uh, children in my own East Phillips neighborhood. We are a very dense population of wonderful people. Today, District 62 is comprised of three complete neighborhoods, Phillips, Whittier, Stevens Square, and 10 blocks of a fourth neighborhood, Powderhorn Park. Some of you may know where some of these places are. So the broad, <clears throat> the broad culturally rich diversity of this district is such an honor for me uh, to leave from and to go home to every day. I feel so lucky, and so I say thank you. Gracias, megich, maha senet. And recently, I learned a new word in Nepalese, which I wrote down, and I will find it in a minute. <laughs> um, oh, here it is, Dan Yaveda. So I've greatly appreciated these active uh, part 
participants of uh, my constituents, and I uh, have appreciated that you've collect, kept electing me to work with you these years, these um, three plus decades. I have to say, I've often been um, deeply challenged in this job. <clears throat> I will believe, excuse me, <clears throat> I will be leaving some of that challenge to you, my dear colleagues. I um, now have to refer to my successor, whoever that may be, and I can't tell you because there's no endorsement yet, to consult <laughs> with uh, dear colleagues like Jim Davney here, who smartly warns, don't mess with or underestimate East Phillips neighborhood constituents. <laughs> Despite being the lowest income constituents, they know how to organize and make their voices heard. They fought for and got the East Phillips Park built and saved and expanded and reopened the Phillips Pool, which had been closed down. And they're still envisioning and hard, fighting hard to get um, legislative help to rescue at least a part of an old warehouse, the former Red Depot, and turn it into an indoor urban farm with aquaponics and year-round agriculture instead of a storage dump from my city's water pipes, which is their plan. That didn't happen this year, but it did get started last year, largely thank, thanks to Representative Garofalo. Really appreciate that. Uh, you championed that incredible coalition of Native American, Latino, Somali, and low-income white residents of East Phillip to get the architectural drawings done and the business plan happening. I've learned about this kind of organizing for legislation with my constituents, and I'm grateful for their leadership and their persistence. I'm humbled and sometimes I feel fierce about trying to be a voice with them, a bridge to help them figure out how to navigate this amazing legislative system that is still, I believe, one of the best claims to democracy in Minnesota. And Diane Loeffler, my knowledgeable and good friend from Northeast, reminds me that persistence, a trait we both share, <laughs> is important and not to be underestimated especially in those of us who are women of a certain age. Right, Mary Murphy? So I want to say thank you next uh, to my colleagues. Many of you have become very special to me, like part of my family, and I will miss you as I leave here uh, in January. I learned very early on that we would not always agree, but that we all need each other in various ways. A very wise colleague once gave me important advice in my first years of service here, and I want to share that with you and pass it on. It's been helpful to me and made it more possible to keep going when I felt disappointed or discouraged. He said, Karen, try to remember this. That person you disagree with so strongly today Maybe the person who you need or who needs you to vote with them tomorrow. So don't burn your bridges. It's been one of the best pieces of advice and information that I can pass along. Many of you certainly already know and practice this. There are times, certainly when I've had to just take a space from a colleague who I felt was very hurtful or even downright mean or bigoted. Still, it's important for me to remember those words and also some other words that my mother gave me about fighting religious bigotry and injustice. I want to say a special thanks to, uh, to my DFL caucus, so full of thoughtful, bright, and caring people. Um, beginning with Melissa Hortman, you've been great. And all the minority leaders, and I think I have them all written down. I want to miss, I hope I don't miss anybody. Paul, Marquardt, Ben Lean, Ilhan Omar, Puli, Rob Eklund, John Applebaum, Mike Freeberg, Laurie Halverson. How did you get everybody? Rena. Did I not say Rena? Rena. Rena Moran. Oh my goodness. I feel um, I will be leaving so much unfinished business, and I will be trusting you to take it um, boldly forward, to be hopeful and not cynical. Ellis Hausman, you've been one of the best models for that. The Posse Caucus, Rena Moran, Peggy Flanagan, Aaron McQuaid, Fu Lee, Mary Kunish Fodin, Jamie Becker-Finn, Susan Allen, of course, Carlos Mariani, 
your bold and thoughtful leadership um, and tremendous organizational leadership has, has been very um, special and has really helped this caucus grow. I thank you for that. Frank Hornstein, who has always been one of my most progressive allies and friends, both here and in the streets. Peter Fisher, who I could not have survived with without this, this year without you. I always have relied on my seatmates and they on me, and it's been a special joy. Um, it's been a joy to serve with several new legislators when they uh, came here. Ray Dean, you sat right next to me for a while. Dave Pinto. Plus State Senators Bobby Champion and Scott Dibble, who I believe is, to, is with us here. There he is, <laughs> okay. Senator Scott Dibble, my brother. I want to um, also thank the Republican Caucus, both leadership and individuals. And I'm not going to get to say everybody, but Speaker Dowd, thank you. Thank you for your leadership. Majority Leader Joyce Pepin, thank you. Thank you so much. There's some, a couple of um, other people on the, who have become important Republican friends. Um, I see Rep Representative Hamilton isn't here right now, but I especially thank him for his work together on urban agriculture. He helped make that all possible, both Representative Hamilton and Representative Anderson, Representative Paul Anderson. Representative Fabian, who I call my little brother, for reasons that have to do <laughs> with family resemblance and just plain connectedness. Bob Lunen, who tried to teach me how to play the bagpipes. <laughs> I have a long ways to go on that. <clears throat> Representative Garofalo, I want to say something to you about the fact that we still have a walk together in our future somewhere in that field that I don't know where it is, so you'll have to take me there. <laughs> Representative Baker, I just want to say, I may be leaving here, but I'm not leaving behind the work that you're doing on the opioid crisis. That's very near and dear to me in my neighborhood and people. So any way I can be helpful in the future, I want to say that. Coming back to some of my own caucus here, I want to say some of the work that has been most um, difficult but gratifying has been around the issues of environmental justice. And I want to say to Jean Wagenius and Connie Bernardi, and Rick Hansen, I guess, has, has left, um, that I'm really counting on you to carry that forward, and I intend to find some way to work with you on that. I'm not going to become a lobbyist, don't worry, but I do think I might show up and help in some ways. Um, in our little pod, um, Leon Lilly, who's right, right there to be inspired by, I have to say what you're going through and how you're handling is so inspiring. Thank you. Thank you to your colleague. I think of other colleagues who have been really inspirational. Sandy Mason, some of the st speeches especially you made this year have been just brilliant. I thank you. John Lesh, you've helped me figure out a few legal things that I had, just some questions here and there. Deb Hillstrom, you're helping us all with those with issues. I want to thank my Iron Range and labor friends, Mike Sundin and Jason Metzka, and I think you know, Mike Nelson, yeah, there you are. Labor, labor leaders that I have certainly relied on. And sitting right there, oh no, he's not. Tim Mahoney, where did, I guess he might have left. Tim has been such an ally and friend and buddy working on stuff in the jobs committee and other ways, and I, I thank him. So I want to just move now to thanking this institution, which I have really loved. Um, I love the work that's here. There have been many changes, but some of it's still much the same as when I started. For example, as was mentioned earlier, the front desk, Patrick Murphy. You were here two years before, <laughs> before me, and now he's here with his son, Jorge. And it, you've just been wonderful. I, I want to um, share something with the rest of the of you all here too. Um, 
Institutional information and memory is really important. And I refer you all to Patrick to learn about how our first and early predecessors here had legislation translated into Swedish, Norwegian, German, and French, and a couple of other uh, languages too. The reason that we had we had hearings that are called hearings now is because some people didn't read, a lot of our earlier predecessors didn't read, or they didn't read or understand English, so it became a rule. I got the documents that Patrick's shown me where um, this translation of the legislation and the governor's message were required to be put into those languages. And I think it's helpful and instructive when we get into discussions here about immigrants and, our, and the language and cultural issues that, that we consider around that. So I, I thank you for that uh, institutional knowledge. Um, Patrick and David Suarez, Cerdez, you've been just a great friend to, to look up to and, and ask for help, and I thank you too. Um, I think you came the same came in the same time I did. So we were sworn in. <laughs> Great, uh, Gail and Marilee. Gail, you've been here 20 years, I believe. Right. So um, I mentioned swearing in, and I just want to tell you a little bit about that for a moment. Um, my swearing in was exciting. Um, I, like I said, I didn't plan to be here, but I did find out much later <clears throat> that I almost did not get to serve here because there was apparently a motion prepared to deny me my seat. At that time, apparently some of my Republican colleagues were working on a motion to keep me from taking the oath of office because as an open lesbian, I must be an immoral person. I didn't find out about that until much later. My DFL caucus protected me from that information and so I went about my very business. Uh, and I have to say, over the years, this legislature has been blessed with the pres presence of at least a few more um, openly gay legislators. Um, I think there's three of us here now. Too few in my estimation, but at least the loneliness of those early years is moderated by the growth in strong allies, strong allies throughout this body, um, both as legislators and staff and and uh, community members. You all know who you are, and I know who some of your friends and family are that you've shared with me over the years, often confidentially in the midst of painful debates. So that's a thank you to you beyond constituents, beyond colleagues, and more thanks to this institution which made that possible. I realize that challenges in this arena will continue both inside and outside this institution, and I'm sad to say it surfaced again in the election campaign. Um, in my own district with the six candidates running for office, and that's disappointing. But it will and has serviced again here in this institution, but you can all, uh, we can all hopefully um, work to, ch to face and change that and um, use our legislative power, use your legislative power, not mine in the future, to constructively, constructively build on um, some of the issues. So for example, um, I call upon you to help Aaron May Quaid pass the bill that uh, would finally outlaw the torture of gay youth to try to change them so that in the so-called conversion therapy bill. That bill didn't get a hearing, but I hope it will in the future. Um, I just wanna say I understand that so-called therapy uses the kind of pornographic exposure, heterosexual pornographic pornography, and should be banned for all the same reasons that porn and trafficking legislation that you sponsored, Representative Lomer, uh, passed this year, that was good, and I hope this can be a point of institutional unity, and we can come together on that. I also want to thank Governor Dayton. He's not here, but he is here, and I appreciate that um, we have been working with him productively. One of the persons I want to say a very big special thank you to is my wonderful staff at the office, Amanda Rudolph. Amanda is amazing. She takes care of her whole pod, the three of us, but she also is just an incredible inspiration, generous person that many of you all know. And I just thank you, Amanda, miss you. I wanna say a couple other staff people that have been particularly helpful. Bennett, 
who's helped do our media work, my media work, um, Noble tonight, you really came through, helped with the computer so I could have this, this document. Earlier, Bob Meyer was um, pointed out, Bob, you have been incredible working with you, and I thank you. You've been so good to my constituents and to others, and just you're you're just a model, as as was said earlier, um, professional. I want to thank our our photographers, Andy in particular, and some of our researchers, many of them have done so much work with me on the, the kinds of legislation I've worked on over the years. There's two that were particularly want to mention because they've been, <laughs> been done an awful lot of work. I've asked a lot of them, and that's Deb Dyson and, and um, Mary Mullen. So now I want to just turn to probably the most important thank yous that I can give, and that's to my family. Jacqueline is here tonight. I thank you for coming. I know you got up at 5 o'clock this morning to do farming out at the Women's Environmental Institute, which is a small nonprofit that I'll be spending some of my time with when I leave here. Jacqueline is my spouse, and she's the main reason I'm leaving at this time. Um, we need more time together. We need more family time together. Um, and some of that's going to be for fun, and of course, to continue um, our work with uh, the Women's Environmental Institute. Um, and that work is both urban and rural, so it's, uh, it doesn't necessarily take me all away from here. I want to thank one other wonderful person in my family who's here tonight, my dear sister, Cindy. Cindy, or Cynthia, as other people call her, <laughs> um, lives up in northern suburbs, and I don't get to see enough of her. She's my baby sister. And I'm so anxious to spend time with you and your two boys who are 15 and 17 because they're growing right up and I don't want to miss their, these years. We get, I get to spend some time with them, but I need a lot more time. So that's one of the joys. And Cindy, when I <laughs> called her and told her that I made the decision to retire, she was whooping it up. And so were every other single member of my family. <laughs> They've been after me for a while. Jacqueline and I made, did make this decision about two years ago. Um, uh, but I said to her at the time, we need to not talk about this because I don't want to be a lame duck for two years. <laughs> One might be enough. I wanted to mention, um, Cindy um, has, this is not the first time she's been here, she's visited me, but she was also a page here in my first year in the legislature, came from Rock County Laverne High School, uh, where Representative Schumacher represents. So I'm going to wind up here with just uh, some unfinished business that I would like to ask you to, to carry on in some way if you can. The first one is this whole area of urban farming. We've just started. We need to develop it. It is a very important food source for people in the city, especially low-income people, and there's a lot of energy coming out from that. I've especially appreciated, again, as I mentioned, Representative Hamilton and Representative Anderson, who actually took time to come and, and tour several urban farms, Mishkigigitagan, which is Ojibwe for Medicine Garden, and Little Earth of United Tribes in particular, and they also looked at the site for this East Village indoor urban farm. So I say um, special thanks to you again, um, uh, Representative Graffel, for understanding the whole point of that and how it works. But um, when I'm gone, I hope it can carry on. The, the second thing I, I would, I feel, sad that I could not make much headway at all in this area. And that is in the area of developing a really meaningful cancer registry. Some of you may know that I'm a cancer survivor, and my own experience just heightened my um, deep commitment to that issue. But here's the deal. Any of us who are on the cancer registry, because cancer is a reportable disease in Minnesota, any of us who are on there, the information is so shallow that it doesn't really help us understand or advance any sort of epidemiological um, information to try to understand where some of these things come from. What's missing that should be there is residential and occupational history. It's not a lot, of, it's not a huge ask. I just ask you to work on that. Another um, area I'd like to ask you to carry on, and, and I've been working on this, well, I started about 20 years ago and then set it aside. This is the issue of reparations. I began with a proposal when Congressman Conyers first introduced that bill at the federal level. And um, I started the bill again about 
four years because four years ago because when I started the first bill, it was addressing um, uh, descendants of slavery and how in Minnesota there may be there are issues that have to deal with reparations. But at that time, the African American community said, "Let's just wait. We're not quite ready at the grassroots level yet." Um, this time, I added. Um, uh, Native American genocide to it as well. And actually, I have to say, there's great interest from both communities with this, and I hope it can go forward. I've had the bill in, but again, I didn't get a hearing on it. One of the other areas is childhood lead poisoning, and I will spare you all the information on that. We talked about it again yesterday, but I just we just need to deal with this fact, this problem that affects at least 700 kids in Minnesota every year. Swimming. <laughs> One of the things I really wanted us to help do was to help make swimming something that our children had a right to learn in school. And um, it's been talked about, but it's not, it's not happening, and it needs to carry forward. Um, gender and women's equity and, and equality issues. I, some of you, um, I mean, we've dealt a lot with the issue of sexual harassment recently. Um, I think I was, a, I mean, I know I was the first author of that legislation many years ago. Um, and then we added uh, unemployment compensation too. There's more work that needs to be done on that. Uh, I would ask us, to, I would ask you to go forward with issues of gun safety um, and uh, chemical dependency issues. I mentioned the, the, the situation with, trying, with Representative Baker. I also want to say, in addition to a penny a pill, which I thought was very reasonable, <laughs> One of the bills that I worked on, probably introduced it a dozen times, was something called a dime a drink, just to try to put uh, together a, a reliable and steadfast, sustainable um, source of funding for chemical dependency treatment. I'm going to just say the last um, thing, <clears throat> last assignment would be would be to deal with uh, some of the issues here. One of the sculptures or busts that I would hope would happen sometime is that of Koya Knudsen. We need to get her recognized. She was the first woman from Minnesota to go to the US Congress. And it was proposed, I think, maybe by Phyllis Kahn right after she died, but the decision at that time was she hadn't been dead long enough. She's been dead long enough now. <laughs> we should go forward with that. Somebody please pick that up. And then just carry on uh, the other human and civil rights um, protections that we need. So I just want to say that um, what I wish for you all is um, that you continue to care for each other and as you care for the earth. And um, that peace and justice will be in your future, that you don't give up hope. Because I do think hope and the willingness to um, believe that change can happen is such an important part of life. It's been one of my joys. And um, I would love to hear that it's still working here and, and is with you. Finally, I just love you all, and I, I thank you for, again, for this great opportunity to work with you and serve you. Bye. As is customary, are there any other speeches? <laughs> any other speeches? All right, well, I want to take a moment to thank our most capable staff, and I'm going to read a list. So hold your applause, and we'll thank them all at once. Uh, to our front desk staff, who does such a wonderful job and has been thanked uh, so many times al already tonight. Uh, and everyone in the chief clerk's office, all of our, our sergeant and all of your staff uh, and everything that you do for us, uh, the photographers and I know the people in house TV who I hope appreciate that we start session every day on the second on time. And everybody in the public information office, our pages, Capitol Security and our state patrol that are here with us every day, uh, house uh, research, the HR office, all of our partisan and nonpartisan staff, give them a huge round of applause for everything they do for us. Yeah. 
Retiring members, thank you for your service and best of luck in the future. Everyone else, thank you for your service this session. Drive safely tonight and enjoy your summer.